Uh, so, <clears throat> did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Maybe? <clears throat> Barely survived it, I tell you. <laughs> Way too much. Okay. Uh, we already went over the slide, but I just want to point something out. Um, diseases that can jump from other animals to humans are called zoonotic diseases. For example, um, the flu. It's actually was um, it's one of its primary hosts was um, birds, specifically waterfowl, and um, then it managed to jump to humans, um, and um, it can jump back again. It can jump into another host like um, uh, the 1918. Uh, flu was called swine flu because supposedly it jumped from pigs to humans. Um, so, okay. Um, there's a number of different kinds of pathogens, organisms that can cause disease. Uh, eukaryotic pathogens, in other words, single-celled organisms, or maybe actually multi-celled, um, but eukary uh, eukaryotic like us. So they have a nucleus and all that kind of stuff. Malaria is, you know, the most, the one you probably know the most. Bacteria, um, viruses, and then something called prions. Um, so, let's see. Okay, so here's a eukaryotic cell, here's a, a cocci, a staphylococcus, um, E. coli, um, and uh, here it shows uh, that they're, you know, prokaryotic, so I don't, we don't, I don't really use that word anymore. Um, so... And then viruses, and viruses are the smallest ones. Um, uh, so, um, let's see, one of the most common, I would imagine, uh, eukaryotic pathogens, of course, is malaria. Um, also, uh, a whole slew of worms, <clears throat> another intestinal tract um, uh, organisms like uh, Giardia. Um, a lot of the worms are you find you find them in oh, the water supply. Let's say in, in that's not very san sanitary um, in Africa. Um, they often have a really complicated life cycle. Um, some of these uh, cause sleeping sickness. Um, let's see, yeast cells are um, a kind of uh, fungi. So here's a uh, malaria. Um, as you remember, um, with hemoglobin, um, Individuals who are heterozygous are resistant to the parasite, 
and they have what's called heterozygote advantage or heterozygote superiority. We already went over that. So they're still trying to uh, develop a vaccine for malaria. It probably will not be 100% effective, but it might help. Um, Malaria parasite is um, proving it's getting resistance to uh, various drugs they use to control it. So they are also looking for new drugs. And it's um, transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito. Okay. So there. So um, you can see. flagella that the bacteria use. Um, these are more cocci, round bacteria. These are spirochetes, like syphilis. And these are rod-shaped bacteria. Now, everybody used to think that bacteria were bad, but they're not. In fact, our world, world will, would probably come to a, a halt without them. They do so many different things in, on this planet. They're probably the most ubiquitous form of life. Um, now, in, as I mentioned, in us, we have, well, a slew you know, millions of, of uh, kinds of bacteria and trillions of numbers, trillion more cells of bacteria in our, in our guts, let's say, than, um, than we have as our cells, okay? It's a lot. Um, a lot of bacteria uh, do things um, that help us, like make cheese and yogurt and things like that. Um, Oil-eating bacteria, um, not very successfully used to clean up the Exxon Valdez. Okay. Now, anything that's disease-producing produ uh, is pathogenic, right? So, um, a lot of the bacteria, uh, the symptoms are caused by toxins that they release. Um, in some cases, the toxins um, are just a byproduct. Um, in other cases, uh, the toxins actually help the bacteria uh, to survive and reproduce. So like cholera, the bacteria of the water supply and food, foodborne and waterborne illness. Um, and what it does is it releases these chemicals so it completely flushes out the digestive tract. So it doesn't have to compete with all the other bacteria that are already in there. Uh, and the reason it actually kills people is from dehydration. Um, some, of course, there's all sorts of different bacteria that cause different things, um, but probably one of the common ones, tetanus, you can probably get a shot for that. Um, botulism is a toxin that also kills lots and lots and lots of uh, avian botulism, bird, bird bot. So, um, now, bacterial re reproduction uh, is slower, right, when it's cold, so that's why you don't want to leave your uneaten chicken salad sandwich out in the, in the sun. And um, they reproduce very, very rapidly. Um.
So, as I mentioned, bacteria are very diverse, numerous. Um, they do all kinds of things, including some that cause disease. Um, bacteria have a cell wall, unlike animal um, cells. Plants have a cell wall, too. Um, and so this is basically how they keep things in and out. But um, most of our antibiotics actually target uh, the cell wall. And on the right is a whole bunch of different kinds of uh, bacterial diseases. This bacteria is a rod shaped with um, some with a flagella, so tooth flagella, as a matter of fact. I did a dam. Okay, I'll remember that. Now, we've kind of gone over this. Um, antibiotic resistance, just like in terms of evolution, which we learned about a long time ago, um, bacteria evolve. Some individuals have um, maybe some mild resistance to an antibiotic, whereas all the other ones get killed by it. It um, makes up the, the next generation and the next generation population. And so over time, you can get uh, individual bacteria that are more and more and more resistant. And then you've got to go start looking for um, new antibiotics. And so we're kind of behind the eight ball now because antibiotics aren't real, a real big winner for the pharmaceutical companies like, um, let's, like Vi Viagra is, right? Okay. Now, Okay, so that kind of shows you how quickly antibiotic resistance can actually um, occur, uh, and very high concentrations of antibiotics. In fact, that's the reason why when the doctor gives you antibiotics, you should take the whole cycle of them and not cut them off, let's say, after two days because you feel a lot better. Okay, so that's why antibiotic resistance now it's becoming more and more of a problem. Um, the government is now um, uh, in a partnership with some pharmaceutical companies and they're also looking for new kinds of antibiotics as well. Okay. Um, viruses. Viruses are, <clears throat> here we go, so uh, rabies virus um, right here, uh, influenza, tobacco mosaic, um, this is a phage. Uh, that infects bacteria. And in fact, uh, I kind of alluded to this earlier when we were talking about that new technology for gene editing, uh, CRISPR-Cas. Well, that actually came from um, bacteria. It's their actually, it's their adaptive immune system. Every time they or their pre previous ancestors got infected, they made a tag of DNA sequence or RNA sequence, whether it was a virus that was made of DNA or RNA, uh, that it could then recognize again. And then when it does, it uses Cas, which is basically a, an enzyme, uh, to, to cut up the DNA. So bacteria have a pretty um, advanced immune system 
to protect itself from phages. Now, there's also counter um, defenses by the phage. They're kind of in a, uh, this nuclear arms race. Um, going on and on and on, each one perhaps evolving new mutations and the others then also evolving new mutations or they don't, they go extinct. Okay. Now, uh, viruses are the perfect parasite, I would say. They don't do any metabolic processes themselves. All they really are um, is, let's take a look here. They have this protein coat. These things sticking up, and that's how it gains entry into the cell. Or that those are leaving, actually. Okay. And then inside is viral DNA or RNA. And that DNA, well, in this case, it shows this RNA. Um, it's then used um, reverse transcriptase, another um, enzyme to make DNA. Then it's transcribed. Uh, translated in the whole cell, and then the new viroids or particles uh, start budding out. Um, in many cases, it kills the cell. Um, in other cases, uh, like, oh, there's a whole bunch of viruses that infect us, and we don't show any real signs of it whatsoever. So, Basically, they kind of hijack the cell's machinery to make copies of themselves. Um, now, some people say viruses aren't real life, but I, I disagree. So there's a lot of dispute about that because they don't do metabolism. No, they, they're just using a cell's metabolism. So cold viruses, of course... Um, attack membranes of the respiratory tract, they infect those. Measles viruses infect um, these immune cells in the lung, and then those immune cells spread throughout the body through the lymphatic system, and um, that's basically what they're um, attacking, are these immune cells. In fact, that's the reason that um, People who get measles have a depressed immune system. Now, they used to think that, oh, it only lasted for, let's say, a couple of weeks, but that's not the case. So we'll see that in a little bit. But uh, it's very, it can last like a couple of years, and it wipes out all the memory cells in the immune system. So previous infections that are now... Um, circulating, but maybe with a new mutation or something, um, before they, the cells would have been protected, the cells of our body would have been protected from it, uh, but now they're not. And this often leads to um, increased childhood deaths, mortality. Um, rabies and polio, they both attack the nervous system, HIV, also attacks the immune system and it actually kills many of the uh, immune system cells, T helper cells. Now, some viruses are cell specific. They'll only attack certain kinds of cells. Uh, some are species specific, like they'll only be found, let's say, certain viruses that infect humans only in humans. And then there's other viruses that can be zoonotic, right? They can jump from species to species. Um, HIV actually, when it's in our system, it, it evolves. Um, and the HIV that, let's say, you see in the spleen is not the same uh, variant. Well, it's related, but it's different than what you see in the bloodstream, because that's a different environment. So 
HIV viruses can um, attack the, the immune system anywhere, and, and the spleen is part of that. So, all these little... Um, These guys, all the way around, these are phages attacking this bacteria. And so, um, now, bacteria, we found out, of course, have evolved this immune system, this adaptive immune system, all, all on their own. Um, otherwise, they would have been destroyed by viruses. <coughs> Now, yeah. A bacteria is alive. Are viruses alive? No, right? Well, there's a dispute about that. Yeah. They don't do any metabolic processes in themselves. So some people have considered them not alive. But basically, they're doing metabolic processes. They're just getting other cells to do it for them. Mm. Okay, so they're like a parasite. I consider them alive. They evolve, just like any thing else, mutations, all that. Um, so that's why the flu vaccine, you have to get a new flu vaccine every year because different strains are circulating, right? Um, now, when we were talking about uh, cancer, it turns out, I, I mentioned this too, um, a lot of bacteria, a number of bacteria can cause cancer, or viruses can cause cancer. And you can understand how the viruses inject the DNA into our host cells. Um, that DNA is then inserted into our genome, and then it's transcribed and all that. Well, that's kind of where cancer comes from, you know, from problems in cell division and all that. And so, like human papillomavirus and cervical cancer, um, there's some relatives of um, HIV uh, that cause lymphomas um, in, the immune, in the immune system cells. Now, there's a lot of viruses that um, they're latent. They're not causing any disease at the time. Uh, they're just kind of hanging out. So chickenpox is a great example. Uh, the chickenpox virus basically travels through nerve cells and then kind of hangs out in nerve cells for maybe the rest of the person's life. But occasionally, especially when they get a little older, um, they'll get a shingles infection, which is the same virus that's been hanging out. And something people aren't really sure about what causes that to happen. Happen, stress, increasing age, chemotherapy, uh, actually cancer. So, and that's what we do, by the way, with we, with um, HIV drugs. We essentially put them in a latent stage, so there's no circulating virus. Uh, in the bloodstream of the lymphatic system. Now, uh, the reason HIV is such a, um, a deadly disease, or it was, uh, is that like measles, it attacks the immune system, but it destroys the immune cells. Um, specifically, um, helper, yeah. You said was a deadly what? You said HIV was a deadly disease? Well, it is, but it's now, with a cocktail, many people, it's a chronic disease. So there's no virus circulating in the bloodstream. Um, but before that, before the advent of these drugs, uh, it killed everybody. Okay. So when it first showed up, um, basically, in the 80s, um, 
people didn't even know what it was, what was causing it, but they found out it was a virus. Yeah? Do you know what the origin of AIDS, HIV, like how it started? Yeah, in Africa. And it seemed to have jumped from um, monkeys to humans. It was a zoonotic disease. In monkeys, it's called simian um, immunodeficiency virus, but it actually doesn't cause any disease in them. Uh, so, monkeys um, produce simian virus particles when they're infected, but it doesn't make them sick. Well, in Africa, uh, a lot of people rely on bush meat, um, wild animals to eat, and some of those animals are monkeys. So it looks like it, in, it um, kind of jumped from there into humans. Um, because the only way to get HIV um, is fluid or blood products or all that. Well, if you're, you know, tearing up monkeys and, and all. Right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So, um, and it, it normally kills people because of opportunistic infections. In other words... All these diseases or bacteria that we have in our body that our immune system controls, they go wild. So cytomegalovirus um, infects the eyes and makes AIDS patients, made them go blind. Uh, toxoplasmosis is a eukaryotic parasite um, that infects the brain. Um, it, it, there's a, we'll get, we're going to get to that, that uh, toxo thing, but... Um, that's where it kind of hangs out, this parasite does. The body kind of insists it in the brain. Well, when the immune system is breaking down, it all erupts. So you end up with, um, you know, terrible uh, brain problems, which you die from. There's a number of different kind of pneumonia-like diseases that normally would never cause us any kind of problems whatsoever that now do, uh, or when you have AIDS, kind of like the same thing that um, a lot of chemotherapeutic agents for cancer uh, do the same, they kill the same cells, and often those people are uh, at risk of having an, an immune system that doesn't work very well, so they get these opportunistic in infections. Um, and like I said, these are infections that would normally not cause they would not be pathogenic. It's only because the immune system has been destroyed. Yeah, so in the, in the 80s, uh, um, HIV was a death sentence. Absolutely. No one, almost no one survived, except I'll show you in a bit in a second. So, so, Obviously, it needs transmission from bodily fluids, blood, semen, things like that. It's not present in high levels of saliva. Um, HIV, because it's an RNA virus, so instead of having DNA double-stranded, it has single-stranded RNA. Uh, RNA is much more prone to mutations, so HIV rapidly mutates. Uh, in fact, some of the early drugs that were used, um, they'd use one and it would quickly um, develop resistance to that drug, these antivirals. So remember, antibiotics only work on bacteria, antivirals work on um, viruses. Um, Let's see. There's a genetic diversity among HIV virus, viruses. Uh, in fact, you can find different strains of HIV in a person. They might get uh, infected with one strain, and then that strain then creates mutations because some of the um, immune cells are, let's say, found in the spleen. And so some mutations allow... Uh, that virus to interact better with spleen cells uh, than others. So there's a lot of genetic diversity because it's an RNA virus. Um, now, they used to just treat 
The first one was a drug was called AZT, an antiviral, and it worked for maybe a couple of months, and then the disease came back, and then the patients died. Well, they finally started um, making a drug cocktail, and there's various <laughs> drugs that they use um, that actually keeps AIDS virus completely in check. So you'll find no AIDS circulating in the bloodstream, but it's still actually hanging out by inserting its DNA into the immune cells, right? But it's not killing them. Um, and so this combination drug therapy that work, it kind of works on, each one works on a slightly different pathway. One might um, uh, target re reverse polymerase, which is what they use to turn, the virus turns itself into DNA. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kind of pathways that can, you can attack a virus with. And so there's a much smaller chance of getting a mutation that will escape all three of the drugs. And so there's resistance might, let's say, um, uh, develop for one of the drugs, but the other ones are going to kill it. Okay? So, um, that's why HIV today is not necessary. well, it's not a death sentence. You have to take these drugs for your whole life. So, they tried taking some of these patients off the drugs, and their HIV came back. So, it was obviously latent in its in its uh, immune cells. Now, there's another thing that's kind of interesting. Um, there are some people who were born with a mutation that makes them immune to HIV infection. They have um, the CCR5 mutation, which is actually a deletion. And so they're not making a, the protein on the outside of the cell that the HIV virus can actually attach to. Um, even people with heterozygotes, just one copy, are much more resistant to HIV. So um, there's been people walking around with, uh, let's say, um, HIV, but it's not causing any disease whatsoever. Or they're not, they don't have any disease, they don't have any HIV, never infected them. Now, um, they're trying to use that uh, to uh, replace the immune system of HIV-infected patients. Nah, it's not really happening much anymore. Um, some people have actually been killed, uh, cured of HIV, like this fellow. Because um, he underwent a, uh, he got a kind of cancer, and so they replaced his bone marrow, where all the blood cells are made, and gave him completely new bone marrow, and that's where a lot of the HIV infected cells were, were, were at, and so he was actually cured of HIV. Um, they're still working on a vaccine, but like I said, it's diff difficult because there's so many mutations that are um, happening in AIDS. Um, they've actually, you know, they've actually traced AIDS from where it first started, and they have, um, you know, like tissue from different places, and you can see how AIDS has, over time, evolved. And like I said, it also evolves in the body to attack different cells in the body. Okay. People probably heard of Ebola. Um, that was in West Africa. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, I think since the 70s. Um, it's called a phylovirus. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Um, it's a hemorrhagic fever because one of the um, things it does is it causes patients, it uh, disrupts their, um, the pH of their blood, plasma, and so they can bleed out of anything. 
so they often die from bleeding out, <coughs> and it's really gruesome, and it's a terrible disease. Uh, in the past, it was usually just found like in the Congo in small villages. It would kind of wipe out that all the people in the village, and because it causes such serious disease that humans are not the primary host. In fact, they're not sure what the primary host is. Uh, they're thinking maybe bats, but no one has actually proven it with a definitive test. Uh, it turns out chimpanzees and, um, and gorillas get it. So oftentimes it'll be, you know, infecting those populations and then bushmeat and all that infects the humans. Now, the difference was in West Africa that it, it lasted a lot, much longer period of time. So usually in the past, the small village, it would infect, kill everybody and burn itself out. That'd be the end of the infection. Um, also, it's one of those infections where if you get it, you're not traveling, okay? You are, you're lying there. You're completely, you know, there's no way you're going to go anywhere. Maybe perhaps early on. But anyway, it's hard to actually transmit it. It's only with bodily fluids like washing dead bodies after, after they died, which is a common practice. Um, now, they've also, um, it turns out, they were looking at uh, people who had survived, who um, had never gotten um, Ebola, like in West Africa, this latest big um, epidemic. And some of them showed that they had been infected before with this virus. It was probably not um, recognized as such. It might have been, you know, mis mistaken for malaria or a whole bunch of other diseases. Um, the chances of Ebola coming to the United States and causing widespread disease, nah, it's not going to happen. Um, like I said, if you take proper precautions when dealing with AIDS patients, that means you're in a whole body suit, um, then you can treat them. Um, they're coming out with some new drugs uh, that look like they're going to be successful. And they're also trying out a new vaccine as we speak. But to give you an idea of what it was like, it was kind of like the Black Death on a small scale, where usually whole villages, they'd be wiped out. It got into cities in Sierra Leone and um, uh, oh, Guinea and, um, and another country and got into the cities there, and really went haywire. But eventually, um, they set up these Ebola wards where the patients were quarantined, and then if they died, they had burial squads that buried them very quickly, um, and they tried to stop any new infections. And that's eventually what kind of happened. There's still some Ebola um, patients now, that are getting infected, but it's not happening like it did. So probably what happened is a lot of people got infected. Um, some survived, uh, and those, they're no longer susceptible to, to Ebola. Okay, so there's these diseases called prion diseases. Now, they're still a mystery. Um, they uh, are not caused by a virus or a bacteria or any other sort of microbe. What they are is um, somehow you get this protein in the brain that is misfolded. And that's not a big deal, right? But if you get a protein like that, when it touches another protein, it misfolds that, and so it spreads throughout the brain. And in, in eventually what you end up with is like a Swiss cheese brain. Um, now, these prion diseases were first um, uh, studied by this, uh, this guy named Gondrzek, who got a Nobel, Nobel Prize for it. Um, he was working with this... Um, 
in New Guinea, this tribe of um, New Guinea Highlanders. And one of their practices was that they ate the brains of their dead. Okay? Um, and it was, it was not eating the brains of some other a tribe or something. It was themselves. Now, the thing is, the men usually didn't get it because they were eating mainly muscle tissue. But the women and children were eating brain tissue. So they get infected with this disease, and then all of a sudden, in a few months' time, they would start showing a lot of neurological problems, um, like you know, spastic movement, cognitive, all that, and then they quickly die. So he was wondering, you know, well, what's causing this, and also how is it spread? And he figured out it was um, cannibalism. And so they, once they stopped this practice in this tribe, the North, they were called the North Four. Um, that pretty much ended the transmission of, um, of this um, spongiform encephalopathy uh, of the brain. So that, he was the first one to actually show that you could get a disease from a misfolded protein and not from some microbe. Oh, the name of the disease was called Kuru. Uh, and when it was discovered, right, like I said, um, in the 1950s, um, uh, among this tribe. Now, uh, you guys have probably heard of BSE, or mad cow disease. Uh, this is another form of a prion disease. It also um, attacks brain cells. Um, hold on one second, I have to, <coughs> thanks, um, much better. Now, um, so it turns out, uh, livestock get it, and people who were eating, um, brain tissue, when it first showed up in Great Britain, I guess, um, some people like to eat brains, I actually ate brains once when I was living in Italy. Scrambled eggs and brains. It was pretty good. Um, anyway, uh, it jumped to humans, and all of a sudden you got these people that are coming down with this neurodegenerative disease that was much like Kuru. Uh, a lot of these diseases um, infect, like there's one called scrapie that infects sheep. Um, there's another one that's really terrible called... Um, Fatal familial insomnia. In other words, these patients can't go to sleep. <clears throat> and they die a horrible death. Um, and it progresses very rapidly. No, don't stop eating meat. Meat's good for you. Ribeye. Ribeye. I like ribeyes. Anyway, once, um, once the mad cow thing was recognized, uh, mad cows, when they get it, they show neurodegeneration, just like people do. Um, and so there's now a protocol in place where if a cow is exhibit, exhibiting any sort of neurological problems, they immediately kill it, they test it for spongiform virus, I mean, spongiform um, prions, and then um, they might quarantine that whole herd so that it doesn't get into the food supply. Okay, so we have a pretty um, complicated immune system. Now, like I mentioned earlier about um, bacteria that have an adaptive immune system so they can fend off viruses. Uh, we also have that. In fact, we were really surprised, people were, when they discovered that bacteria had such an advanced immune system. I mean, it's not hard to understand when you actually look at what it looks like. Um, it has these guide pro um, <clears throat> uh, 
these guide um, DNA or RNA that from a previous infection by a phage. And then <clears throat> uh, any times that, and these things are circulating inside the bacteria, anytime they're getting reinfected, they immediately uh, recognize it, and then their, their <clears throat> uh, Cas enzyme cuts it, the virus up into little pieces. Well, so we have, we also have what's called, first of all, we have innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Um, well, our skin is actually a good way of keeping um, pathogenic diseases out. Um, there's a lot of biochemical barriers. Uh, oh, let's say when you get like a cold, do you start sneezing and runny nose and all that? That's kind of mucus um, that is, is that is designed to trap the, the particles, the viral particles. Um, and uh, there's other things as well. So now, and then there's also this innate immunity. And so our immune system actually um, is very good, just like the, ba the bacteria, at recognizing um, invading organisms. Whether they're viral or bacterial, doesn't matter. Um, and you've got a bunch of different cells that actually are recognizing um, whatever is causing that disease. So, uh, like the measles virus, um, there are cells that, let's say someone's been vaccinated, if they were, let's say, infected by measles, they would wipe it out right away because their body has already seen it. Whereas if someone isn't uh, vaccinated, then um, they're likely to get infected. And as I mentioned, it, it targets the immune system cells. So one of the problems, like with, well, we'll get to that. Okay. So anyway, there's this um, adaptive immunity. Um, and there's B cells, lymphocytes. Um, some are just memory cells. Some are attack cells. Uh, and they start an immune response right away. Oh, also fever. Often we get fevers. It's actually not a symptom. It's actually our body using an innate system to kill some of our invaders. Okay. Uh, tears and saliva have antimicrobial chemicals, mucus trapped path pathogens, inflammation, all that kind of stuff. Oh, also, we have a lot of bacteria living on us and in us. And those bacteria actually protect us because they protect, they, they don't give another bacteria or virus a foothold in the system. They're already occupying it. Now, uh, our white blood cells, the, the immune system cells, a lot of what they do, some of them create um, antibodies, but others release chemicals, uh, histamines and various other things that kind of cause blood vessels to leak um, into a, an infected area. And that causes inflammation, and that also causes a whole bunch of immune cells to congregate on that area. And then fever, fever is thought to inhibit the growth of microbes. So uh, there's some pretty good evidence in some cases. OK. As I mentioned, adaptive immunity is learned. Remember when I told you that um, during our lifetime, individuals are affected by natural selection, and then populations evolve? Well, I was lying a little bit. 
Um, first of all, I already told you about cancer. So that's like individual cancer cells are evolving in your body. That's actually you. Um, also, our immune system is all designed to produce these new immune cells that immediately recognize um, past infections or new infections. So, like Ebola, people didn't have immunity, and so it took a while for their immune systems to actually get into high gear. Some of them actually survived, but um, in, the, in the future they won't have any problem with Ebola. They'll have adaptive immunity. They'll have these cells that have the antigens, the Ebola virus, um, and any time they recognize that or a cell infected with that, they will start an immune response and kill all those viral particles. And these cells actually evolve in our immune system. Each time we get infected with a new pathogen or a new bacteria that maybe doesn't cause disease, our body creates cells and remembers that pathogen, in a sense. It's not like, oh, I'm thinking, oh, I know who this guy is. No, it's just recognizing certain proteins associated with that pathogen. And so our immune system is actually evolving all the time. And it, every time we come into contact with a new um, disease-causing organism. Oh, and they, um, and in the bottom here, it shows them um, antibodies. There are all these um, uh, immunoglobulins, different kinds of chemicals that uh, a lot of T cells produce um, to kill bacteria. So, and then there's the antibodies that they're released, and they when they recognize. Uh, a foreign invader, they glom onto it, and then it's destroyed by other T cells. So, so um, this is kind of how it works. Um, B and T lymphocytes, which are made in the bone marrow from stem cells. Uh, by multipotent cells. In other words, they can um, differentiate into all kinds of different blood cells. Um, some are found in the thymus. Um, some are in the bone marrow. Lymph nodes uh, and the whole lymphatic system. Um, in the spleen. So the stem cells give rise to all these different kinds of cells, and one of them is all these different immune system cells. And it's all based on what individuals have been infected before, so that they can mount an immediate response instead of waiting for their immune system to catch up. So as I said, an initial infection with something is usually a very slow response. But if you survive it and you get subsequent exposures, the immune system recognizes it amounts an immediate attack and, and pretty much finishes it off before it can actually cause disease. Now, this is the basis for vaccines. Vaccines stimulate the immune system to recognize, let's say, the antigens on these bacteria or the viruses, and um, just like if you had been infected, except that the vaccine is not going to cause any disease. Now, it might um, start a, an immune response um, because your immune system is starting to recognize it as foreign, but it's not actually causing any disease. So this is the rapid memory response. <clears throat> um, and obviously, there's some diseases that are, it's good to have the vaccine. Because um, without it, people would die. Uh, like rabies, um, people who get rabies 
it's a neurological disease. Usually, though, they know when they've been bitten by a rabid animal, and <clears throat> they've got a window of time where they can get the vaccine, and it's a whole bunch of different shots, so that it kills the rabies virus before it actually causes total destruction of the, uh, of, of the brain. So I think there's been a, a couple of people who've actually survived rabies, but uh, they were really severely brain damaged, and usually it's just fatal. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how it says that, the, that a vaccination provides like a first-time exposure? Yeah. Wouldn't that then refute what like a lot of doctors say and that the flu shot wouldn't give you... No. Okay, so we're going to get to that, but good question. Now, there are some uh, microbes that get mutations, and those mutations allow that, that strain of, let's say, the flu virus to escape the old vaccine. Because the old vaccine is usually um, a combination of, it's made from different flu strains that are circulating in the population, and then that's usually what people are going to get infected with. But sometimes, like um, last year, they had a vaccine that didn't work very well because the, um, the flu strain that was circulating, one of them was really not causing any problems this, that year, but other ones were, and so the, all these new mutations, the vaccine was not working. So because the flu virus mutates or changes very rapidly, evolves, are, that's why we need a new vaccine every year. Um, there are other vaccines where you just need them once, like measles, uh, and they are completely um, safe. Uh, it just depends. And that's why it's been so difficult to get an HIV va vaccine, because HIV evolves mutations rapidly, right? So that's how it works. <coughs> So, and usually what they use in a, as a, vac in a vaccine um, are, whether it's a bacteria or a virus, um, they have like um, a weakened virus or a dead virus. That's how they used to do it in the past. Now they actually take antigens, these proteins from the virus um, that the viral particle um, has on its outside. And they use that, so there's no chance of, um, of the virus actually, of the vaccine causing any disease. Because it turns out that some, it turns out in the past, like um, polio virus, uh, there were some people who actually got polio from the virus because it mutated in the, in the person, it was a weakened virus, and <clears throat> then... Uh, mutation, mutated into a much more virulent strain. But that doesn't mean people shouldn't get the polio vaccine. You don't need it anymore because it's just about wiped out. But um, vaccines save millions and millions and millions of lives. Okay. And then, uh, obviously, a successful vaccine stimulates antibody production. In other words, there's the memory response. So when you come in contact with a new a disease that you've been vaccinated against, you have an immediate immune response. Um, the memory response can be long-lasting, but not necessarily like flu. Uh, usually you're protected for the rest of your life against a lot of these, let's say, childhood diseases. Um, and any foreign particle that the body recognizes as not self it's called an antigen. And that's the way, actually, the immune system often, you know, stops cancer from going wild. So here we go with the flu shot. Um, during viral replication, uh, 
the virus gets mutations <coughs> that then make different proteins. These are the antigens that the, the body then doesn't recognize as a flu virus. So it's kind of like starting over. So when these new mutations come in, it's called antigenic drift. So in other words, this happens, and our immune system will no longer recognize it as a pathogen. So it reinfects, and we'll get the, the disease. <laughs> Okay, um, now there's another thing. Viral genomes can actually recombine. If two different viral particles can occupy the same cell, remember they insert their DNA or RNA into the cell's genome, uh, they can swap parts of their genomes and they can create a very different viral strain. And this is actually called antigenic shift. So this is when you get kind of a hybrid virus, and drift is when you get new mutations. Um, in fact, this is the way that we actually have like um, the cells of other animals in us, in our genome. You wonder how did that happen? Well. A virus infected that animal, and then um, new particles were made. And that virus, when it was infected, the, the person, um, it actually uh, it picked up that DNA, and it, that DNA was then incorporated into the person. So normally, what happens is the DNA, um, you know, gets inserted to the genome makes all those viral particles, and then that's the end of it. But sometimes uh, viruses may infect another animal, and it's, going, it's actually going to carry a bunch of DNA from that animal. And uh, so it's called horizontal um, evolution. Um, but it's, uh, it's, hap it's probably had a, a huge effect on evolution, but you don't need to know that. Just You need to know that viral genomes... They evolve just like anything else that's alive. So, as you can see, um, this is um, a flu virus infecting a cell. Um, the end <coughs> protein helps the virus get out of the cell. The H protein helps the virus get into the cell. And um, there's like 17 different alleles for the H protein and nine for the um, N protein. So you can see all kinds of different combinations uh, that would end up producing different kinds of proteins. So the flu that killed all those people in 1918 uh, had these mutations that were never seen before. Um, They've managed to reconstitute it from a uh, gravesite up in um, the Arctic of people who all died of the flu. Um, and also the flu is a, I guess uh, it's, I thought it was, well, I'm pretty sure it's um, an RNA virus. Okay, so... Antigenic drift versus antigenic shift. Drift is just a mutation. So new mutations occur all the time, and those mutations may allow that um, individual particle, whether it's a virus or whatever, to then evade the immune system because there's been enough mutations that the immune system doesn't recognize it anymore. And then Antigenic shift is when two viral strains inside a cell uh, recombine and swap genes. And so it basically allows, these kinds of things can allow um, viruses to infect cells that normally wouldn't be um, able to infect them. So the um, 
SARS was was a, was a recent one, but uh, in 1982, um, it was a variant that had undergone antigenic shift. Um, in other words, it had combined with other viruses and gotten new alleles that made it much more transmissible. Uh, and <clears throat> It also, some of the alleles allowed it to um, infect other cells just besides those in the respiratory tract. Uh, they managed to find, um, to figure out the sequence of this virus, because I mentioned they dug up a grave and there were individuals who had died of this flu. Uh, there were still those flu particles there. Um, usually DNA and RNA kind of break down, but they were able to figure out what it looked like, and so they could see exactly how it fit in um, the flu universe, how it was related to one thing versus another, and that's how they could tell that it actually had, um, it was a recombination of, of two viral viruses inside a cell. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is this a correlation? Yes, it's a correlation. Correlation between pirates and temperature, the spurious correlation. Sorry, I, that was better what I did before. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, you get the idea, right? Um, actually, for a long time, it seemed like global warming um, and pirates was an inverse correlation. But it's, now it's with all the stuff in Somalia and all that, you know, you get more pirates. So who knows? Okay. Now, okay, so here we are with um, measles and autism. Now, you guys have probably heard about this, that there's a whole bunch of anti-vaxxers out there. When, does, uh, when do people get the measles vaccine? Baby. Baby. When do people start showing signs of autism? Baby. Close. Right. Okay. Now, here's the question. Does a measles vaccine cause autism? No. Well, no. well, let's just say we don't know. So, what would we do to find out? Hmm? What would be, if there is, okay, first of all, what's a prediction if there is measles vaccine causes autism? Hmm? Anything? Well, it'd be hard to like really tell if it was the actual like vaccine that's causing it. But I mean, you could run a study of um, the amount of people that you inject them with the vaccine mm -hmm. and how many of them end up with autism. Okay, so that'd be another correlation. But if you were going to really design a study and you didn't give a shit what happened to people, <laughs> you know, whether you gave them autism or not, what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> now, medical ethics says we can't do that. It's unfortunate. But um, that would be one way. However, there was this uh, fellow in England in, I guess, the 70s or something like that, 80s, who claimed <clears throat> that he had data that showed <clears throat> um, cause and effect. Well, it turns out he made up his, all those data. Okay. But since that time, there's been this talk of autism and measles vaccine. Um, <clears throat> now, once this stuff started coming out, and scientists didn't say, oh, you're full of, you know, garbage. Uh, they said, okay. And they went and they tried. They've got models for autism. Um, they've got... They did some, a whole bunch of stuff with, um, with like rats and then monkeys and all kinds of different things where you could actually do experiments. And, um, and then they also showed that it was pretty much bunk. Okay, so they disproved it. Now, unfortunately, people are into magical thinking. And what I mean by that is they're susceptible not to reason. Reason is, I think, a a rather new thing in terms of human cognition. In the past, you know, um, lightning and thunder, oh, that's some god 
rolling bowling balls down the alleys of heaven or something like that, right? Um, let's see, lightning strikes, uh, hitting people. That's because God's angry and wants to take them out. Now, um, when, uh, what was his name? Um, um, one of the founding fathers. Who discovered electricity? Ben Franklin, right. So Ben Franklin, <clears throat> he didn't actually discover electricity, but he realized that lightning, it looks like, was electricity. He wanted to make sure. So he sent up a, <clears throat> a kite uh, with um, a piece of wire, I guess, all the way to the ground, and showed that it <clears throat> actually hit that, and then all the way to the ground. And after that, people were using um, uh, lightning rods so that instead of getting hit, people's lightning rods, it would hit that, and then it would ground to the ground, and that was no big deal. Unfortunately, God was angry. That's what he told um, uh, some of his uh, preachers who said, God's angry. And then there was a huge earthquake, and they said, that's because people were putting um, lightning rods up there. And so God had, a, had to have another way of killing people. Okay? So that's, that's kind of reasonable, too. Anyway, there's a lot of magical thinking around, um, including conspiracy theories. One of these conspiracy theories is the vaccine, uh, measles vaccine autism thing. Okay. Now... There's something called herd immunity. Anybody know what that is? Herd, like a herd of cattle. Immunity. Anything? Let's have a, a guess. What do you think? Here's a bunch of cattle. Yeah, go on. Okay. Yeah, everybody's immune to something? Or? Yeah, exactly. So one way you could get a herd immunity is if, if all the people got the disease and survived it then they'd be, they wouldn't be susceptible to the disease anymore because they'd have immunity, a, um, adaptive immunity, as we've kind of learned. Um, another way is through a vaccine. If you get to a certain point with a vaccine in terms of the number or percentage of people that have gotten the vaccine, there's very few susceptible people, and so it can't really carry an epidemic. If you're something like 90%, the chance, there's only 10% people that are actually available, and it's likely the, any kind of infection like that will not go anywhere. Okay, so herd immunity protects a lot of people. There's also people, of course, who can't take the vaccine. Uh, they might be immunosuppressed, so they can't take the vaccine. A um, whole bunch of different reasons. So those people actually benefit from herd immunity and everybody else. But there's something that, that's been known for some time. Um, okay. And that is um, measles, as, we, as I mentioned, attacks immune cells. Now, it doesn't attack them in the same way that... Um, that HIV does, but uh, it wipes out the memory cells in the immune system, mainly um, some B cells and memory T cell cells, that if there's been a previous infection, the immune system then has these cells that it recognizes immediately if that infection comes back. Okay, so when people get measles, it kind of wipes out their memory cells. And it used to be thought it would, you know, after a couple of months it would come back, but it, it's not the case. It looks like now it lasts a number of years. So suddenly you have a whole population of little babies and uh, infants that are suddenly susceptible to all kinds of diseases that they might have had before, but it might have been a strain that was, let's say, um, less virulent. And then, now they're susceptible again. Okay? So, let's take a look at this. Um, okay. 
Now, uh, this right here is non-measles infectious disease mortality. That means death from other infectious diseases besides measles. And, um, and then, uh, let's see, on the other side, hold on. Uh, oh, the other side is annual measles incidence per 100,000. Okay, now this is a correlation too. But, and um, let's see. Right here is when everybody was getting vaccinated in the beginning, in the 60s, for measles. They had a good measles vaccine. Okay, so down here um, we have, this is measles incidence, okay, and then here, up here we have infectious disease mortality in England and Wales. So what is that, um, what's, what is that correlation? Hmm? Anything? Is there a correlation between measles, getting measles, and in, uh, infectious disease mortality from uh, some other infectious disease? Isn't there? I'm gonna look at this. In fact, let's, uh, this is a correlation, so it's a pretty strong correlation, okay? Now, no one has proven this, but not only is there a correlation in England and Wales, there's also in the United States and also in Denmark. So, that means people who got measles, infants, they then maybe survived measles, it's not that hard to survive from, but they then got sick from these other infections that they already should have had immunity to. So um, when you come across people who say, you know, vaccine causes autism, um, you can actually whip out this piece of information. And I've actually put um, uh, on the website, on Moodle, um, uh, a link to a paper, a couple of papers. Um, one kind of describing what's going on, the other, the actual paper from which this data is taken from. So, because these are the things, when you're done here, um, I don't know if any of you are gonna have any more science, but, you're going to be out there, and you have to make decisions about what you believe, and in other words, what there's evidence for and what there isn't. So I just want to make sure you understand. Also, um, some of you are going to end up in the hospital, or you're going to know someone that does, and you might ha have to advocate for them. So that might mean that you're going to have to apply your science head to some of these problems. Instead of thinking that, you know, um, some demon has infected someone, okay? So, kind of gone off a lot too much there. But anyway, <laughs> um, I just want you to get the idea. So, this is um, fairly recent. Um, they obviously can't not give the vaccine to people, like if it was a controlled experiment. Um, but they've still got fairly strong correlational data in terms of who's susceptible to um, other infectious disease mortality. Uh, and measles is certainly the candidate for that. Okay, now, there are things called autoimmune diseases. What does that sound like? Huh? What do you think? Okay. Hold on. We'll let him look it up. Oh, you want me to look it up? Oh, oh you don't know. Okay. I thought no, you were looking it up. No, I'm opening my notes. Oh, okay. Just, uh, just guess. So it's immune, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Auto. 
So there are okay. Let's see. Is it ever possible for our immune system to attack our own cells? Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's what autoimmune is. Autoimmune diseases. Uh, there's a slew of them. Um, type 1 diabetes, not type 2, not the diet one, but the one for usually strikes uh, um, kids and um, they're insulin dependent the rest of their lives because it kills all the beta cells in their pancreas. So they can't make insulin anymore at all. There's uh, multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis, um, the immune system attacks these myelin uh, cells that kind of are a sheath around the neurons and that help signals not leave, you know, not scatter from the neurons, keep it on its way. And so when this happens, people get a whole bunch of neurological problems. Uh, a lot of times they go blind, um, they, get, they lose a lot of their strength, um, they become bedridden. Eventually they can get to a point where they can't breathe, all kinds of things. Um, there's some new drugs that are being tried out now, um, but it's a pretty bad disease. Um, well, that's a, caused by autoimmune, where the body is attacking these sheath cells. There's another, another autoimmune disease called um, Crohn's disease, which is of the intestines. Same sort of thing. Um, there's autoimmune diseases that attack the eye, all, all sorts of the heart, all sorts of different ones. So, now... <clears throat> This really shouldn't happen, but you can see how it would, um, <clears throat> where the uh, immune system gets a little overactive. Uh, and so normally what they do for these diseases is they treat it with um, immunosuppressive drugs like steroids. Unfortunately, of course, when you use immunosuppressive drugs, those people are then susceptible to actually getting a disease. Okay. There's been some question... It seems like these diseases are more common than they were. Um, oh, rheumatoid arthritis is another one. Lupus, like I said, there's lots of them. Um, <clears throat> rheumatoid arthritis has been around, well, from old bones, at least 600 years. Um, but it seems like there's more now than there were in the, in the past. And there's been some ideas about what might be causing it. <clears throat> um, now, nowadays, everybody is afraid of germs. <clears throat> and so if you live in the modern world, your chances of coming in contact with germs are much lower, right? And there's some evidence that the, um, our microbiome, all the gut bacteria and viruses and fungi and things like that, <clears throat> when we're getting our gut bacteria, which happens shortly after we're born, <clears throat> we get some from our mother, but then it's environmental. And there's some evidence that people who live in very clean environments, their immune system doesn't get taught properly about what is self and non-self. And it looks like the microbiome has a lot to do with that. Um, so, in fact, there's, I mean, there's correlational evidence for that. <clears throat> there's uh, these two towns um, that are next to each other, one in Russia, uh, one in Finland. Um, the Finnish town has, is much cleaner than the Russian town. So, uh, people were actually looking at these two populations, and there was people were is kind of like um, there was this idea out here that maybe the, growing up in a really clean environment may not be as great as people think it is. So um, they looked at this place and a bunch of other places, and they found this correlation, and that is in dirtier places, the kids that grew up 
tend not to get as many autoimmune diseases and allergies as well as kids that grew up in a really clean environment. Now, I would think that I'd rather grow up in Finland than the Soviet Union in terms of dirtiness. But it turns out the Soviet Union kids grew up and they had very low incidence of um, autoimmune diseases. So there's a lot of evidence now that's starting to support this hypothesis um, that being, well, if you ever have kids, uh, make sure they eat dirt. Okay, yeah? If you get a person from the Soviet Union, would it be possible to be put him in a cleaner environment, or like let's say the U.S., it would be harder for him to get sick because he's so used to a dirty environment? Depends on for how long. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I imagine, um, probably, yeah, let's say you have someone who's going to the Soviet Union and kind of dirtier, they're more exposed to microbes, and then they come here when they're 18 or something like that. They'll probably be at a disadvantage, okay? And in fact, they'll be at a disadvantage probably, um, oh, no, they'll be at an advantage, sorry, Soviet Union. Finland's the other way around. Okay. Yeah, you put someone from the right. environment. Yeah. yeah. So if you took Finnish people and then said, go travel, they're probably more likely to be susceptible to other diseases. They're also being more likely um, to have autoimmune diseases as well. Okay? So all this stuff about, you know, antimicrobial soap and all that kind of stuff, I'm not saying you shouldn't take showers. And I mean, that's, that's a nice thing to do. But um, this idea that we're surrounded by microbes, which we are, is going to kill you, is not true. We actually have an adaptive immune system, right? And that adaptive immune system is very good at recognizing um, antigens from microbes that cause past infections. Yeah? Couldn't the same thing be said like for pain? Like, I feel like if you're growing up and you're very, like, coddled and you're not, you know... Out and about? Yeah, you know, out and about, whereas, like, kids who are kind of running around, they're, like, you know, jumping around and stuff, yeah. falling down, like, they're not as, they're That's, not going to get in as Right. Much, yeah. They're not, yeah, they're, they've become kind of perpetuated from breaking arms and shit, <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's true. There's also, actually, there's an, uh, um, there's a genetic disease where, um, there are some people, well, first of all, pain tolerance varies. There are some people that this can take a lot, and others can't. You know, like the old boxer with a glass jaw. You hit him and whoop, he's down. Someone else, like Roberta Duran or something, and, you know, you hit me, I'll hit you harder, right? Okay, um, but there's actually a genetic disease where people are born and they really don't feel pain. It's extraordinary. So they might get their skull cracked, you know, fractured, all that kind of stuff. They'll keep going. They don't feel it. In fact, there was a character like that in one of those, um, oh, Christ, it was that Norwegian film about a girl who was kind of messed up, but she was very good at um, figuring out crimes. And she came across... Um, Oh, this, uh, what was it? Oh, there was a serial killer. I forget what it was called. The girl with a dragon tattoo? That was it. Okay. Anyway, there was a guy in that that you could hit with a baseball bat, and it would just make him mad. Now, eventually it might actually, you know, cause real damage, but it just made him mad. He had a genetic disease where he just didn't feel pain, like, so he kept going on and on and on. It would be like he puts his hand on a, st a hot stove and, you know, all of a sudden he's sm smelling bacon or something like that. Okay. So, there are genetic diseases, of course, where the immune system, um, or was in this case pain, but like the bubble boy. You probably heard about a bubble boy who was born without an immune system. They kept him in a bubble um, because any sort of microbe would cause him, well, to die. Um, lived until he was like 14 and then he got sick. So there are people like that as well. So I just want you to understand about um, different kinds of diseases and one of them is autoimmune diseases and they're, they're pretty terrible. Um, 
There's actually, now, I, this is an anecdotal. Um, I heard it on the radio, on NPR a while back. Um, there's a, a guy who had um, multiple sclerosis. And um, he heard about this guy in Australia who said, you know, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease, but I bet you I could actually cure you. Um, and let's see, what did he do? Oh, that's what he did. That's right. Um, he did something called a fecal transplant. Any ideas about what that is? Fecal. Feces. Feces. And transplant. Someone else's feces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyway, first of all, um, fecal transplants are done now, um, mainly for um, after someone goes through a series of antibiotics, oftentimes it kills their whole microbiome. And it makes it susceptible to um, uh, a bacteria called Heliobacter. Um, I think that's what it is, or it's probably another one, that causes terrible um, diarrhea and all that. And it's very hard to get rid of. And they found that the, the best way to get rid of it is to take a fecal solution from someone else. <clears throat> they don't give you a cup to drink. Um, they took a long tube down your throat and then they inoculate you with all these new microbes. And that usually seems to actually cure the infection much better than putting someone on all these new antibiotics to kill this bad bacteria that's screwing things up. Okay, well, he felt at the same time that there's probably this, this doctor in um, Australia, you have to take this with a grain of salt, but that it's um, <clears throat> multiple sclerosis is, n is a known autoimmune disease, and that he decided to start giving people fecal transplants to kind of recreate their microbiome. Now, it turns out he's had a lot of success, but I don't know exactly how many people are actually, doctors are actually doing this at this point. But there's some evidence, so you have to take it, like I said, with some skepticism. It's not, it could be just um, magical thinking or there actually could be something there. Um, I think they're doing experiments like that with people just in terms of looking at, um, I mean, it's not, if someone with multiple sclerosis and actually giving them a fecal transplant, there's probably not terribly many, well, I guess there could be bad side effects, so don't, don't go with that. Anyway, that's enough for now. <laughs>